production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckets join me shortly. Our topics this week, the state of the city and the state of the city's e-tax. Are taxes the only answer to Kansas problems? And a taxing few days for the Donald, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and welcome Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum at 18th and Vine. We'll talk with Bob about the upcoming Ken Burns documentary detailing the life and career of Jackie Robinson, the first African-American to play big league baseball. And we'll also check into what's happening with plans for the Urban Youth Baseball Academy. The documentary Jackie airs April 11th and 12th, next Monday and Tuesday at 8 p.m. both days here on KCPT. Bob Kendrick, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Mike, thanks so much for having me. Museum hosted a special activity last Friday, I believe, where yeah. uh, guests stopped in and joined you and watched a preview of the Jackie documentary by Ken Burns. I know you didn't see the whole thing. It was like 40, 45 minutes, but, yeah. but what was your reaction? Amazing. And, and I'm not surprised at the quality of the filmmaking. Ken Burns is one of the best, yeah. if not the best in the business. And the subject matter ain't too bad when we're talking about Jackie <laughs> Robinson, so it's not surprising that it's outstanding. But as I sat there watching that 45-minute screening, I, I'm just left, I mean, I'm sitting there on the edge of my seat. It was so gripping, and it was so enlightening. And Rachel Robinson comes across, you know, she's as large as the screen herself. And I sat there, Mike, and I thought about the, the, the film Baseball, when Ken did his baseball series, right. and what it did for our very own Buck O'Neill. Buck was 82 years old when, when the Ken Burns baseball documentary came out, and it became an overnight sensation as a result of. Again, he was a known commodity, but he became a star at age 82. I keep believing better to be famous late than never. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it hasn't worked for me, and, but for, for Buck, it turned out okay. And it's gonna, I think the same thing is going to happen with Rachel Robinson. Yeah. She comes across That's so uh, beautiful. The widow of the widow Jackie, of Jackie Robinson. Uh, uh, what was Robinson's connection to Kansas City in baseball? Well, his professional baseball roots began here. And amazingly, a lot of Kansas Cityans don't know that. Jackie's career began in the Negro Leagues right here with our great Kansas City Monarchs, 1945. And so it was our city and the Negro Leagues that gave America arguably its greatest hero in Jackie Robinson. Because there's no question that Robinson's breaking of baseball's color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement. It was the beginning. And he was active in civil rights activities off the baseball field. Oh, absolutely. He and King became very close, and he was a very important part of that movement. He authored letters to President Kennedy uh, speaking out on behalf of equal rights for, for African Americans, civil rights for African Americans. So he became, he was at the forefront. Now, when he did it from a baseball standpoint, I'm not sure he realized what his breaking of the color yeah. barrier was truly going to mean and represent. Is it it fair, probably caught him by surprise. Is it fair to say that even if he had not been a black man, the first black man in baseball, say he'd been a Caucasian player, he'd still be regarded as a great figure in baseball yeah, because could, of his record and yeah, his Yeah, because he could play. Yeah. <laughs> that always helps, doesn't it? Uh, I know the, uh, the museum is involved with the uh, Urban Youth Baseball Academy. Uh, it's a major project. Tell yes. us uh, a little bit about it, what it is. Oh man, we're, we're so excited. Kansas City is the seventh of these Major League Baseball Urban Youth Academies, and now since then, I think Dallas is getting one. But we'll be the only one that has a Negro Leagues Baseball Museum essentially attached to it. So not only will urban kids get an opportunity to learn, grow, be nurtured in this sport, they will also have, the, have access to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and be able to identify with the heritage of this sport. And there are two fields being Multiple prepared fields, there. Four, four fields, four. two regulation baseball diamonds, a youth baseball field, and a softball diamond. But not only are we coming in and redoing the park to create a baseball experience, new playground, 
new basketball courts, new tennis courts, new track. So the community feels completely vested in this. It's one thing to come in and, and create a baseball experience and then do away with all those other things. That would have been a bad thing. But to come in and create this entire holistic experience for the community so that they feel that they are truly a part of this, whether they are baseball fans or not, I think means that much more. And then the other side of this is a $14 million economic project. That is, has the potential to create a tremendous stimulus uh, there and, in the historic And, 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 and that district, district can use oh, yeah, a lot well, of economic stimulus. Yeah, well, you know, all the help we can get. But, you know, there are lots of great things happening. And, and I talk about this all the time. We've created a cultural campus at 18th and Vine. And, and I think as we look at branding the district, that is the thing that sets us apart from other cities across the country. No one else has that dearth of cultural institutions in essentially a three block radius as we do with the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, American Jazz Museum, Mutual Musicians Foundation, Black Archives of Mid-America, a budding. And the Blue Room. The Blue Room. Hey, I got to stop you there because our time <laughs> is gone. Thanks for coming by. It's great to see you. And it's too quick, but it's good to see <laughs> okay. you as well. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Always leave them wanting more. <laughs> uh, Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum at 18th and Vine. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Steve Glorioso is a media and political consultant. Terry Riley is a former councilman, now heads Transformation Consultants. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Patrick Tuohy is the field manager of the Show Me Institute, a libertarian think tank. Good to have all of you with us. Thanks for coming by today. Kansas City Mayor Sly James oozed optimism as he unveiled his fifth State of the City address. James describes Kansas City as full of momentum and pledges he won't let it slow down. The mayor, now in his second term, spoke of downtown's revival, the growing economy, and a massively enhanced collective psyche. But the centerpiece of the speech was simply this. If Kansas City is to survive and thrive, voters must say yes to continuing the earnings tax, an income tax of 1% on all who live or work in Kansas City, Missouri. Voters went to the polls on Tuesday to decide, so Terry, did they make Mayor James happy? Yeah, they made Mayor James, but the entire council happy in the civic and business community. It was no surprise to me uh, that it would pass. Uh, when you are taxing Lee Summit, Blue Springs, Raytown, and the others that come over here and benefit from uh, Kansas City's assets. And so, yeah, uh, the mayor uh, should be very happy. The council should be very happy because uh, $240 million out of any budget is uh, a, it could devastate uh, any economy or any city. So I'm extremely happy about that. Well, Patrick, uh, you were one of the people sure. who spoke out in opposition to the E-Tax on behalf of the Show Me Institute. And Does this end the battle? Well, no, let's hope not. Uh, I think Kansas Cityans were grateful for an opportunity to talk about tax policy in Kansas City, something that the city is not eager for them to engage in. But the problems in Kansas City remain. Despite all this happy talk, we are a high tax, low service city. We have high debt and low cash flow. Uh, because we divert so much money to developers. And Kansas City lags, consistently lags, our peers in job creation and population growth. And despite all this money that the city is spending, the east side hasn't benefited. This is not good enough for Kansas City, and if we're not going to do the uh, get rid of the earnings tax, we need some sort of policy to turn this city around. Uh, unless something changes between now and 2021, the next election would be five years hence? That's right. Uh, Mary, now that we know the e-tax is going to be with us at least for a while, Let's talk about the mayor and the state of the city. What problems does he face now that uh, the earnings tax is behind him? Very good question. Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose the uh, continued uh, need for him to, to uh, succeed east of Troost, uh, you know, this tremendous turnout for the tax, the earnings tax, the, the best thing about it was, from my perspective, was the unif unification of the city. It carried north of, this, of the river. It carried east of Troost and the corridor. And, and uh, that kind of unification has to be attributed to the mayor and the way he unified the uh, uh, political life of the city. But I, um, you know, he said in his state of the, uh, the city that the city has momentum and pride. Uh, it wasn't a terrible, it wasn't a great state of the city address from my perspective. It was okay. 
But his singing <laughs> was the thing everybody <laughs> going to remember anyway, because he sang pretty well. And uh, th it was a he great sang movie. Kansas City, right? He the sang, Bob Dylan uh, version. The Bob Dylan version of yeah. Kansas Which City. Is better. Steve, the mayor said in his uh, State of the City that uh, the psyche of the city is good; it's improved. Uh, you've been here for a long time. You know about the city's <laughs> psyche. Would you say it is true uh, that it, it's improving? And if so, why? Well, uh, you know, our polling going into the campaign to uh, pass the renewal of the earnings tax, first of all, it showed that we would uh, get a percentage of almost Tell me 70, how many people voted. Do about 50,000. Is that is, the same as no, five no, years ago? It's, yeah. it's lower. Um, the thing that was encouraging, as Mary alluded to, north of the river, which uh, generally has been uh, not as progressive as south of the river, voted at 70 percent plus. Or more prudent, depending well, on how you I look Well, but I mean, it, it shows that they're now feeling like they're part of the city right. and they, they agree with what a great idea the earnings tax is. But the fact is, I, you know, the biggest problem that, well, the polling showed that the people in this city, uh, with huge numbers say it's a great place to live. And number two, they felt like it's moving in the right direction. So, you know, I would say this, uh, the biggest challenge the mayor has is the one that every mayor's had since I've been around, which is infrastructure. We have one of the largest cities in the country in terms of square miles. 6,000 lane miles you can cross the country and back if you laid all the lanes out. And uh, you just, it's hard to get on top of that because sewer, water, streets, um, all the things that go into maintaining such a large city, even though our population is growing, it, it, we need to grow the population well, uh, even more. Terry, the city must have saved a lot of money on snow removal this past winter. Uh, maybe that money could be diverted to other infrastructure improvements. Yeah, and, and this is kind of hard, but I, I agree with uh, Patrick. <laughs> no, I'm kidding around. But uh, we, we must micro-target our focus as it relates to uh, urban development, particularly east of Truce. Because in, in the future, if you want to continue to see uh, people to vote for taxes in the earnings tax, now we must, we must show them. Uh, and, and it's not just the mayor by himself, and, and that's what people don't understand. It's the mayor and the council working collectively together. I believe we truly can get some things done east of truth. There are some plans out there. The mayor has a plan. I know the third and the fifth have a plan. And then you have council members that are experienced enough to help them move those plans forward. Well, we just talked with uh, Bob Kittrick about what's going to happen with the... Uh Negro Baseball League Museum and how they're going to have the Urban Youth Baseball Academy set up there. So that's going to be yeah, something have, dramatic. Forgive me, anybody can have an exciting plan, but the city can't can't deliver basic services. It can't cut the grass, it can't pick up trash, it can't tear down 800 dangerous homes uh, for the safety and security of the people in those neighborhoods. So, so we can plan all day long. Let's deal with the basic services that we know are needed right now. Picky, picky, <laughs> picky. Uh, <laughs> no, all the, right, we got to move. The city move does on. provide the services, <laughs> while, and the uh, citizens appreciate that. While Kansas City Missourians may have an enhanced psyche, according to the mayor, it can't begin to compare with what columnist Steve Rose describes as the way Johnson County Commission Chair Ed Eilert and the county's mayors see their communities. Rose says they describe an incredible place to live and work and to raise a family. The unemployment rate is only 2.9 percent. Parks and libraries are expanding and economic growth is occurring almost everywhere. Rose notes that public safety is good, roads and highways are well maintained, poor people get assistance, schools are top notch, and virtually every resident is satisfied with the county's quality of life. But Mr. Rose fears that there may be dark days ahead for Nirvana. Why is that? Let's find out. Start with Mary. Well, there are, aren't any uh, dark days for Nirvana in the near future. I mean, <laughs> what, wasn't it just full of irony? I mean, it lists how perfect it is. Really, I mean, compared to many places in the country, of course it is. The richest county in the, in the state doing very, very well. But there's a threat on the horizon. I have to tell you that personally I had... Uh, a kind of negative reaction for the first time in some time to, to Steve's column. In that, what's going on in the state of Kansas, the big story is what's happening in Topeka to the state as, as a whole. And the, and the just brutal attack of Brownback and his followers on public schools, <laughs> on universities. You're laughing. I am laughing. You, you heard ridiculous. about the, have you heard about the latest bill that just came out? I've got the number here somewhere. The, the new, the latest one yesterday, um, 
would just be a whole scale, a full scale privatization of uh, education in the state, uh, granting uh, tax uh, or actually cash payments to families for homeschooling, cash payments to families to send their kids to uh, private schools and so on. So the destruction of the uh, basic programs of services to people statewide and the attack on the schools, are it's critical right now. In preparing for today's show, I happened to find some old files and I was looking through them and there's a page of notes from a ruckus program in April 2012 and one topic was Steve Rose's column about the state of the county. He was making the same dire predictions four years ago that things were falling apart, school right. finance was a serious problem, all of these things that people are talking about today. Here, four years later, he says Johnson County is doing great. What you learn about uh, newspaper columnists that they have to turn in a column two or three times a week whether they've got something to say or not and clearly Steve had nothing to say when he submitted wow. this. Uh, he rehashed an old argument and it is absurd. It is absurd frankly for people who've been active in Kansas City, Missouri politics to cluck their tongues at what's going on in Johnson County. Johnson County is fine and what Steve, uh, what Steve suggests is that we allow counties to spend more and more and more will slowly turn Johnson County into Kansas City. It's not the solution. Johnson County is, is, uh, is doing fine and Kansas City could learn more. Uh, uh, let me go over here for a second to Steve uh, and, and Terry. Steve, uh, the problems that Mary talks about and has talked about on the program and others have talked about and we read about uh, frequently, is the answer to those problems, is the solution changing the tax code in Kansas, essentially undoing the tax breaks given by the administration and reinstating previous levels? Uh, I've not. Yeah, I mean, anybody that uh, thinks, is money. Uh, yeah, the I understand. You're, you're talking about reverse the the tax yeah. cuts and yeah. 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 that that have been given. Well, you know, Patrick can talk about what he thinks, but I, I'm certainly a believer in polling. That the people of Kansas are relatively horrified. Brownback is the most unpopular governor in the entire United States. People are very dissatisfied with what's going on in Topeka. I think you'll see several of these fanatic right-wing Tea Party legislators get beat in November because people finally have caught on that this philosophy that they heard about is now being put into motion and it's hurting the quality of life in Kansas and it'll only get worse. Terry, one of the problems has been that the estimated tax revenues never quite reached the level that were estimated. But in March, they were only $1.5 million short in Kansas. Should we take that as a good sign? There's pros and cons to the tax breaks, but I think the last massive one that they did end up subsequently hurting uh, the economy. And, and, and the telltale was in the school funding. In addition to that, when you go out and you try to legislate the actual Supreme Court justices for uh, in the state of Kansas for making a decision to give the schools more funding and then now you want to change how they serve and 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 get a recall uh, mechanism in you place. You think they're offended because the legislatures talked well, about finding new ways to impeach judges? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> well, and, and uh, so, I got I got to wrap this yeah. up. I, I, would, I would I would urge people the courts is serious I, I would business. urge people yeah. I would urge people to read the Wednesday Kansas City Star the in-depth section and read the story about Kansas school finance and try to understand it. It is next to impossible. I'll conclude by uh, quoting someone I'm sure Mary does not like, and uh, I can find him. Only well, if you can find it. Uh, the, uh, You're looking through all the people that don't like Mary. Oh, uh, well, Dave Trabert. Dave Trabert, Kansas Policy Institute, he says, and it's a conservative uh, think tank. He says, what school districts like to talk about is what they want. What they need is a different map. <laughs> okay. All right. So much for him. You don't usually yeah, write him off. Uh, you don't usually find Kansas City Star columnist Mary Sanchez concerned about the well-being of the Republican Party, but in a recent article, Sanchez calls on GOP women to save the party from Donald Trump. She notes that Trump has huge negatives among female voters, and that they comprise 53 percent of the electorate. Therefore, Trump's nomination could lead to grave repercussions for the Republican Party. Sanchez wants women to be the voice of reason and persuade the party to dump Trump. But she notes first, they have to take a stand. So, 
Patrick, are we likely to see Republican women following this type of advice? I don't know that anybody reads Mary Sanchez's column, uh, least of which <laughs> Republican women. Uh, but before uh, the rest of the panel goes off on their uh, entirely predictable screeds on Donald Trump and Republicans, it's worth uh, realizing that Hillary Clinton's negatives among Hispanic and white women are uh, upwards of 65%. She's not far behind Donald Trump. Uh, so this is, a, this is a political season. We, we don't know what to make of it because we haven't seen it before. But, no, I'm sure uh, Mary Sanchez is crying well, crocodile and, tears. You know, and we, uh, speaking of the Clinton campaign, briefly, we still don't know the outcome of the email investigation. I know some people just say there's nothing to that. It means right. nothing. But there are serious liberal commentators who say it could be a very, very real problem. She's a damaged candidate, and uh, oh, she's not goodness. trustworthy, <laughs> and, uh, and she's got to deal with this. She's not. She's a in your, it, well, but she's leaving. And, and the odds of her becoming the president are, are up in the 60s and 70 percent range. I, you know, wasn't your question about how women are, are responding or likely to respond to the attacks yes. on them by Donald Trump? This is no, this isn't any laughing matter, Patrick. You can't just brush it off. Women in this country will not stand it up, you know, will not put up with a man who's really rewriting the civility uh, the, the, the most recent episode is, with Trump and, and women was when he spoke about abortion being interviewed by uh, Chris Matthews. Right. And uh, the following weekend, last Sunday, he was on Fox News with Chris Wallace. And Wallace said, uh, Mr. Trump, aren't you blowing your campaign for president? <laughs> so I just got great polls from NBC nationwide. I think that we're doing very well. Don't forget, uh, you have been thinking about that or asking me that question numerous times over the last, uh, since June 16th. I've had the statement made many a times. He just blew his campaign only to end up having higher poll numbers. Steve, let me ask you, uh, is Trump blowing his campaign? And, and while you're at it, tell us about the Wisconsin primary yesterday and what happened in, or Tuesday, well, what happened in both parties. Yeah, I never, you know, we kept saying that from the beginning, started when he insulted John McCain in every prisoner of war that uh, probably ever served in, in for our country um, in the military. You kept saying, oh, this is it. But I think that was it. it you, you just can't have that big a fall in one week. It was cumulative. And the other differences were down to a few candidates in the establishment and the party now is pouncing on him. But let me point out his, his comment on abortion. It's not off. This is what the Republicans really exactly. think. Well, how do you and, know what Republicans no, because, really think, Steve? Well, because they say it, Mike. They don't say Mike, that. Mike, they all it, have said Tell it, me it, this. It, the the Republicans want to outlaw abortion. The answer is yes. It's in their no, platform. No, that's not. No. What? Oh, my God. Oh, oh, that's my. a fact. That's not that's all Republicans. There are many Republicans well, who don't share Most that Republicans want to outlaw abortion. Anyway, anyway did you explain the reason? Most Republicans want to outlaw abortion. If you outlaw abortion, why wouldn't you criminalize a woman? I'll explain to you. But they don't want to say it. I'll explain to you. Trump, okay. is, Trump is finally Steve, saying calm, that calm, the calm down. Uh, always thought Steve, we are okay, as a country of being against drugs, but having a nuanced sentencing for drugs, uh, for drug yes. convictions, right? Nonviolent, maybe you're a mule or something like that, and we can have a discussion about that. We can do the exact same thing about abortion. Your goal mm -hmm. in talking about abortion and locking women up is simply to scare voters. But what you've got to understand is that Hillary Clinton has Who had. Would you lock okay. Excuse me. Patrick, we, well, Mary, you lock I'll start this. They, they, they all said that they right. all said that if and this was a hypothetical question, if abortion were illegal, which it is not, and you well know that, if it were right. illegal, and if there were a conviction. Who would be convicted? It wouldn't be the woman. It would be the doctor performing, no, I'm finished here, uh, performing the illegal abortion. Now, it is time for Roast and Toast. Where the, I'm sorry, Mary, I have to sorry. move on. I can't just plan the program for your convenience. Now it's time for, uh, I certainly can't. Now it's time for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets praise or haze people and events in the news. 30 seconds, Mary. There we go. I'll try to make it, Mike. Yeah, what a hot show today. Yeah. Well, I want, to, I want to toast Kathleen Parker, a Republican columnist who said the following, I used to reject the accusation that the GOP was waging a war on women. If Republicans can't bring themselves to condemn their frontrunner, Mr. Trump's verbal attacks on women, then they are complicit with him. Yeah. All right, Terry. Best quote of the day. You know what? I have a, a local one I would like to uh, toast today.
Chris Marino won yeah. a city council race uh, in Lee Summit. Uh, after all the attacks, uh, a, a number of people in the, uh, the Missouri House went against him, and he won. Also, uh, I would like to say that um, Donald Trump is saying everything that a Republican wants to say. But go ahead. <laughs> no, don't. You, no, he, he's not next. Patrick <laughs> is next. You're not hosting this week, uh, Patrick. <laughs> Hi. Well, a toast to the people who uh, in Kansas City uh, put their names on the ballot to be considered as write-in candidates for the Kansas City School District. After in three districts, nobody actually put their name out before the deadline. But a roast to the Kansas City School District and its administration, who for years has so mismanaged schools in this city that nobody even cares to run. This isn't democracy, it's despondency. And Mr. I'd Barroso. like to give a roast to the so-called group citizens for responsible government, government who oppose the e-tax. This very small group led by a local guy, Dan Coffey, ought to rename the group to Citizens for Responsible Elections and act accordingly. They have failed to uh, abide by a Missouri election law. They put out mailings all over the city without disclosing where the money's coming from and where exactly it was spent. Uh, likely the money came from St. Louis billionaire Rex Singfield and his fellow travelers. Uh, Mr. Coffey and his fellow travelers didn't want to e expose themselves as being pawns to the St. Louis millionaire. Don't throw rocks when you live in a glass house. And finally, here's a toast to a friend and former KMBZ talk show host Darla J. Like many in the radio industry, she learned not long ago how quickly a radio career can come to a surprising conclusion. Darla wanted to stay in the Metro, bided her time, and just recently joined the Johnson County Sheriff's Department as the Public Information Officer. Congratulations, Darla. 10-4. Roger that. Over and out. And so, that is Ruckus for this time. We're back next Thursday at 7. To comment, you can email us at kcpt.org ruckus. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.